And even to this very day, I feel the insects crawling inside me, in my skin, in my abdomen, in my antenna! <gasps> Oh, snap! He turned into an insect in the end? Oh, I wouldn't like turning into an insect. That would really bug me. <laughs> well, that's just great. After that creepy pasta, I feel like I'm covered in bugs. I need a shower. That's good. You feel like you're covered in bugs. That's how you know it's a good creepy pasta. Should we do another? No. Do we have to? I'm already really on edge. <laughs> ah! Oh, I apologize. I hope I didn't startle you. <laughs> no, it's just that we were reading creepy pastas. Creepy pastas? Why, those are my forte. And trust me when I say, mine are to die for. <laughs> I'm not scared. You guys are scared. My first creepy pasta, perhaps my creepiest, is called the tag. <laughs> <clears throat> There once was a very small apple that was annoyed by the tag on his mattress that said, Do not remove. Every night the tag tickled his tiny non-existent toes. Finally, one day he tore the tag off in frustration, but heard a scream as he did. The tiny apple looked all over the place, but he could not figure out where the scream came from. Later that night, as the diminutive apple prepared for bed, the lights suddenly went out. It was a slam, a clatter. The apple was very frightened, not to mention very, very small. Okay, we get it! Who was there, wondered the puny little apple. What could it be? As he reached for his flashlight, a shadow appeared in the doorway. Frantically, the minuscule apple tried to get the flashlight to turn on, but it was far too big for him to properly handle because he was so tiny, you see. Before he could react, the figure reached down and tore the apple's tiny little stem clean off. He screamed in agony and dropped the flashlight, which finally flickered on to reveal the mattress. <laughs> Wait, the mattress is exactly who I thought it was going to be. Guys, where's little apple? Oh, he must have had to go use the bathroom. That's actually a good point. He usually pees his pants at scary stories. It's a good thing he made it to a bathroom this time. Huh, our little apple's growing up. I wouldn't exactly say he's growing. <laughs> Speaking of bathrooms, would you like to hear my creepy pasta called Toilet Monster? I guess we have some time to kill until little apple gets back. Time to kill, indeed. <laughs> Do not flush paper towels, read the sign above the toilet. But the grapefruit could not be bothered to obey the rules. He was, in his mind, too cool for the rules. So day after day, he flushed paper towels down the toilet. What's the worst thing that could happen, he figured. The toilet gets clogged or something, but the grapefruit was wrong. Because the warning sign was not posted, because the pipes might clog. The sign was to deter people from inadvertently feeding the toilet monster that lived deep within the pipes. Thanks to the grapefruit's negligence, day after day, the toilet monster feasted on its favorite food, paper towels, and grew larger and larger, until one day, it grew too big for the toilet and burst out, hungry for more paper towels. As fate would have it, the foolish grapefruit was holding the paper towel roll at that very moment. The toilet monster devoured the paper towels and the grapefruit along with it. Ah! Hold on, now grapefruit's missing. Oh, he must have needed to go buy socks or something. That makes no sense. Ah, but you know what would make sense. Listening to another creepy pasta, <laughs> courtesy of yours truly. No, thank you. I heard yes, please. Very well. This one I like to call boring. Once upon a time, there was a boring pair who wrote boring math equations on the whiteboard. After boring his entire class half to death, his incessant scrawling actually bored a hole through the board. The boring pair fell through the hole in the board he had bored and found himself in a world filled with wild boars. One of the boars charged toward him, and the pair screamed. But the boar stopped in its tracks. Why would I attack you, asked the boar. You're one of us. The pair was very confused, because he was most certainly not a boar. 
And that's when the first tusk jutted out of his mouth. Then another. Then a tail. And a snout. And before he knew it, he had become the only thing he had ever known how to be. An utter and complete bore. Very scary ending. That's because I haven't gotten to the ending yet. Do you know what those boars did day in and day out for the rest of their boring boar lives? Um, what did they do? Algebra! Ah! <laughs> oh, uh, is it just me now? Apparently so. <laughs> yeah, Bear must have left. Uh, maybe he had to rush out to see that new art exhibit about slugs downtown, you know, the one. Well, actually, that does sound like Pear. Oh, yeah, of course it does. And now then, I have one last creepypasta to tell. And I assure you, it's going to slay. <laughs> <laughs> if the story's half as punny as you are, this orange is juiced to hear it. <laughs> as fate would have it, the story just so happens to be about an orange. I call it Orange Slice. Very nice. <laughs> Every day, the little orange's mother would tell him not to run with knives. You'll slice yourself wide open, she used to warn him. But did the little orange ever listen? He did not. How could he? He had no ears. <laughs> Please let me finish the creepypasta. Breaks the mood. One day, the little orange was out playing with his friends. No, actually, he was playing with knives. Uh, knives are so dull. It should definitely be his friend. Aren't you glad I'm contributing to the story? <laughs> I am not, as a matter of fact. I'm a master creepypasta writer. You need to let me tell my story the way I want to tell it. Ah, uh, come on. Let someone else take a stab at the story, would ya? Huh? No! I promise I'll add a twist ending in everything. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Really? The dream I was having was pretty boring. Guys, don't worry. I cleaned up that whole creepy pasta mess. Although, now we gotta clean up this other creepy pasta mess. <laughs> oh. Not to worry, fellas. Grapefruit's on it. Paper towels are right over here and... And that wasn't very smart, was it, Grapefruit? It was at that very moment that Orange realized he'd been eating a dirty gym sock the entire time! Ew! Ew! Did I overhear someone telling a creepy pasta? Ah! Now, Pear was just telling an actual story about me. <laughs> so you actually ate a dirty gym sock? Like, the entire thing? Are you surprised? That's not even that crazy for Orange. Yeah, earlier today he farted the ABCs, so... Enough! Listen, I thought I heard a creepy pasta in progress, and I went to all the effort of doing my creepy entrance routine. I'm on a roll. We're just gonna go with it, okay? Now, who among you is brave enough to hear my news, creepy pasta? The Funky Paw. Is this anything like the famous short story, The Monkey's Paw? No, that story isn't funky whatsoever. Gotcha. Now then, The Funky Paw is a story about a young grapefruit. Here we go. Yes, it is indeed coincidental that you are a grapefruit, and the story involves a grapefruit. Do not interrupt me again. <clears throat> now then, on to my creepy pasta. Which is, as always, to die for. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a young grapefruit who cared very, very much about the way he smelled. What is happening right now? I realize it's coincidental. Now stop interrupting. <clears throat> for someone without a nose, the grapefruit's sense of smell was quite refined. One day, while shopping for rare scents in a shop he had never visited before, he was offered a horrible-smelling funky paw for purchase. The purveyor of the shop told him the paw would grant him three wishes, but there was a catch. 
all of his wishes would be granted in a rather funky fashion. The grapefruit purchased the paw, exited the shop, and when he looked back, the shop had vanished into a cloud of greenish gas. Nevertheless, the grapefruit rushed straight home with the paw and wished for a pile of money. It instantly appeared. The young grapefruit was overjoyed to find the paw worked. However, the pile of cash smelled rather funky. So funky, in fact, that no one would accept it as payment. No matter how much the grapefruit offered to pay, no one wanted his stinky money. And so, the grapefruit was left with a smelly pile of cash that was utterly worthless. <laughs> the grapefruit decided to make his second wish, that the woman of his dreams would fall madly in love with him. Again, the wish came true immediately. She loved him dearly and could not be convinced otherwise, no matter what. You see, the grapefruit absolutely reeked. The stench of his money had permeated everything in the surrounding area, including the grapefruit himself. No matter how many times he bathed or tried to hide it with his ridiculous collection of body sprays, the grapefruit stank to high heaven. But his love was not deterred and remained entranced by him, even though she vomited whenever he came near. Eventually, the grapefruit was at the end of his rope. He was penniless, he smelled awful, and the love of his life was vomiting far too frequently for his liking. I wish for the smell to go away, he thought to himself, before he realized he still had one wish remaining. Why, he could simply wish the smell away. And so the grapefruit took up the paw and began uttering his wish aloud, saying, I wish for the smell. But then, in the middle of his sentence, he caught a whiff of himself and vomited uncontrollably. And unfortunately for him, the paw heard his request. He had wished for the smell, and that's precisely what he got. From that day forward, the funky stench spread across the land, causing everyone who smelled it to bomb loudly and comedically. The smell was so horrid that some people even barfed themselves to death and the stench of their decaying bodies somehow made the stench even worse. Everyone knew it was the grapefruit who had brought the funky curse upon them, but they did not seek retribution. To kill the grapefruit would be too kind. The true punishment was to allow him to live alongside his vomit happy true love and his funky smelling cash every day for the rest of his natural life. The end. <laughs> now that's a creepy pasta that passed the sniff test. <laughs> um, guys, where's grapefruit? Oh, uh, I believe he went to change the radiator hose on his riding lawnmower. Yes. Checks out. I believe it. Man, that was a really good creepy pasta. The way you described the smell, I could practically smell it. Actually, that wasn't the story. It was me. <laughs> <laughs> Orange! Orange! What? I can't help it! I ate a gym sock! <laughs> Did someone say creepy pasta? <laughs> what? Dude! No one said anything! We were all asleep! Oh, well, could someone mention creepy pasta? Like, as a little favor to me? Let me just go get in again. Thank you. Okay, get ready, go for it. Uh, creepy pasta! Did someone say creepy pasta? Uh, yeah, you asked us to. Well, I just so happen to have a brand new creepy pasta to share with you. It's called Swimming Pool Shark. And don't worry, I promise it doesn't bite. <laughs> Excited to hear it! Sounds jawsome! <laughs> Thanks for that, Orange. Really wrecked the mood. <clears throat> Once upon a time, there was a young Orange who loved to swim. Like me? No, less annoying than you. Like me? 
Sure, why not? Anyway, this young orange was excited to learn that a new swimming pool had just opened near her home. Although the name of the swimming pool, Shark's Mouth Public Pool, concerned her. She knew it was a foolish notion, but she couldn't help but wonder if there was a shark living beneath the surface of the pool. Her parents, her friends, the lifeguard, everyone assured her that there was no shark in the pool. Finally, she came to her senses. She was being silly, so she got into the pool, which proved to be somewhat difficult because the edge of the pool was so sharp and jagged. But soon she was having a grand time playing in the water with her friends, until suddenly she spotted a fin popping up out of the water across the pool. And when she looked again, she saw it was just a backlit Dorito relaxing on a pool floaty. Relieved, that's when she noticed blood in the water. She screamed, but it turned out not to be blood at all. Her friend Ketchup Bottle had just peed in the pool again, so it wasn't quite as bad as the orange had feared. Still, everyone was asked to get out so the lifeguard could clean the pool. One by one, everyone began climbing up out of the pool. And as the orange watched her friend Muffin emerge from the water, she finally saw it. Evidence that there was a murderous pool shark on the loose. Her friend Muffin had no legs. <laughs> the pool shark must have bitten them off. The orange's friends promptly reminded her that Muffin never had any legs. None of them did, in fact. The orange realized she was being ridiculous and swam toward the sharp, jagged edge of the pool in order to climb out. But then, suddenly, the edge of the pool moved. Then it moved again. A giant whirlpool formed at the center of the pool. The unfortunate swimmers who were still in the water began getting sucked down, down into the abyss below. As the orange was carried around and around by the current, she looked up and saw what looked like gigantic teeth above her. Moments before she was sucked underneath, she realized why the pool was named the way it was. There wasn't a shark living in the pool. A gigantic shark was the pool. <laughs> They'd all been swimming inside a shark's open mouth this entire time. And now the shark was closing its jaws around them. And with that, the pool became enveloped in darkness, and one final sound echoed far and wide. Go. Oh, that was a good one. It really had some teeth. <laughs> <laughs> hey, where's Sass? Oh, uh, she uh, had to go receive a fax machine message. <laughs> a fax? Nobody sent one of those in like 20 years. Well, you know how long it can take a fax to come through sometimes. I mean, it's like the dee dee dee. <laughs> and the paper gets jammed, you know how it is. Eh, that's true. Well, I gotta go. Just remember, if you want to ever hear another one of my creepy pastas, all you must do in order to summon me is say the magic word. Creepy pasta. Clever. <laughs> it is clever. Goodbye. So let me get this straight, Creepypasta. Every time someone says the word Creepypasta, you have to appear and tell a Creepypasta? Yes, that is correct. Good to know, Creepypasta. I'll be sure to say Creepypasta the next time I want to hear a Creepypasta. <laughs> okay, but please stop saying it. Stop saying what, Creepypasta? <laughs> I'm already here. Creepypasta! I want to go home. Don't say it. I'm going to say it. Don't! But I wanna! Orange, you know the moment you say it, he's gonna pop out of the shadows or something. So don't say it! Don't say what? The word creepypasta! Cause the moment we say it... Did someone say creepypasta? <laughs> ah! Oh, it pleases me that you wish to hear another of my world-famous creepypastas. We actually don't. We just said... My that... latest creation is entitled Spider Cat. <laughs> oh, cool! Is Spider-Man in it? Is Captain America in it? I'm afraid we couldn't afford them. But there is a hat. You like hats, don't you? Um, I guess. Of course you do. Now then, where was I? <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a young pair who was obsessed with fashion. When he heard about a new hat shop in town, Speederman's Hat Shop read the sign out front. 
The pair could tell it was a fancier establishment because of all the extra letters in the word shop. Excited, he rushed inside and was greeted with shelves and shelves of every type of hat he could possibly imagine. And even some he couldn't. Across the store, the purveyor of the shop, Mr. Speederman, spied the young pair perusing the rare hat section. Mr. Speederman asked the young pair if he was interested in seeing the most expensive hat in the store. Intrigued, the pair's eyes widened as Mr. Speederman produced a beautiful black and red box with what appeared to be air holes punched in the top. The pair was perplexed, but his hesitance quickly turned to excitement as the shopkeeper explained that the hat within was all the rage in Paris and Milan. The young pair could not wait to try on the hat within until the lid was opened and he saw what was inside. A gigantic, living, breathing spider. Now the young pair was beyond confused. This spider was a hat? Mr. Speederman explained that yes, the spider cap was the most cutting edge hatwear money could buy. The pair looked around the store to find a number of particularly fashionable patrons wearing spider caps as well. Fearing he might miss out on a smashing new trend, the young pair quickly handed over the considerable sum, signed a contract of some sort, then proudly placed his brand new spider cap upon his head. At which point, it plunged its fangs deep into the pair's head. The shopkeeper assured the pair that this was all perfectly normal. This way, the spider cap wouldn't blow away in the wind. The pair looked around, and sure enough, the other spider caps were secured in their owner's heads the same way. Soon, pair began to feel strange. He felt a slight itch on his back, and so he scratched it. And at that moment, he realized he was scratching his own back. This, of course, was surprising to him because he had no limbs. He rushed to a mirror, only to discover that he had sprouted a long, hairy spider leg out of his body. Then another, and another. As Pear gazed into the mirror, he saw that he no longer had two eyes. He was growing additional eyes by the second. He again asked the shopkeeper if this was typical. The shopkeeper replied yes. Everything happening to the young bear was covered in the contract he had signed. The young bear opened his mouth to reply, but his tongue was gone. It had become mandibles. Pear darted for the door, trying to escape, but the shopkeeper was too fast. Mr. Speederman quickly and expertly trapped the young pair. Or should I say, the young spider. Inside a familiar looking red and black box with air holes punched in the lid. Outside the box, he could hear voices. A new customer had just walked into the shop and was asking to purchase a new spider cap. Ah! Well, that was a good one, creepy pasta. Yeah, you should definitely post it to the World Wide Web. <laughs> uh. That story really freaked me out. Just the thought of turning into a spider and, wait, where's Pear? Who cares, he was boring anyway. Hmm, that's true. <laughs> 17 bottles of pop on the wall, 17 bottles of pop. Take one down, pass it around. Oh no, I just lost count. Where was I? I don't know, dude. I've been trying to zone you out for 20 minutes. Oh well, I'll just start over. 999 bottles of pop on the wall, 999 bottles. <laughs> Seriously, where are our friends? They've been gone way too long. Maybe it's a normal length of time and it just seems long to someone your size. <laughs> hey, creepy pasta! You rang. <laughs> Ever since you started telling us stories around the campfire, our friends have been disappearing. What's going on? Yeah, where's Grapefruit? Where's my sister? And where's my best friend? I'm not your best friend. See? Pear's talking from inside a fire or something. That's not normal, and we want answers now. All right, all right, you caught me. My newest creepypasta will explain everything. What? Just tell us. It's entitled, Ronald McDonald Face. Ooh, let's hear him out, Little Apple. This one sounds really good, and I'm not clowning around. <laughs> oh, it's good, all right. I believe the two of you will. Love it to death. <laughs> uh, 
Um, now then. Once upon a time, there were two friends. A young orange and a young, outrageously tiny apple. Not necessary, dude! One day, the two friends learned that McDonald's was planning to offer some healthier options on its menu. Orange juice with its breakfasts, and apple slices with its Happy Meals. This, of course, worried them slightly, as they were both now on the menu, so to speak. But they decided to have fun with it. The two friends started pranking each other by placing pictures of Ronald McDonald's face in surprising locations for the other to find. Inside the refrigerator, under the toilet lid, on the ceiling above the other's bed. The prank, which they called Ronald McDonald Face, was all in good fun. At first, because after the diminutive apple got Ronald McDonald faced by a picture taped to the bottom of a table. Wait, 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 wait. I think you mean top of a table. No, I mean bottom. I'm telling you, this apple was very short. <laughs> Offended that the table prank had cashed in on his shortness, the apple decided to escalate the prank war. Soon, the friends were hiding wall-sized pictures of Ronald McDonald's face. Any window they opened, any closet door, any light switch they flipped was liable to terrify the living heck out of them. The two friends began to live in fear, terrified that the next Ronald McDonald face might be just around any corner behind any door. They even began to dream about Ronald McDonald face. After weeks of sleepless nights, they called a truce, but that didn't stop the Ronald McDonald faces. Still, they appeared at home, at work, at school, in the bathroom, in the night. The Ronald McDonald faces were bigger and scarier and more surprising than ever before. And what's more, Ronald McDonald's expression was growing more sinister with each and every appearance. His eyes began glowing red, and he began to wield knives with astonishing frequency. The orange and the apple both swore they were honoring the truce, which could only mean one thing. The newer, scarier Ronald McDonald faces were appearing all by themselves. Just as they came to the horrifying realization, a gigantic Ronald McDonald face burst through the wall and swung a knife down upon them. Instantly, the two friends awoke in their beds, having just had the exact same nightmare. They were relieved to find no knife marks on their bodies. It seemed they were safe from Ronald McDonald face, at least for now. That is, until one day, McDonald's announced a new menu item. This was a hamburger, but it was no ordinary burger. You see, this burger had some very curious ingredients included in it. Ingredients you'd never think belonged in a burger. That's right. On top of the patty and lettuce and special sauce, this burger contained... Pasta! What? No. The ingredients were... Pasta! What are you talking about? Who would ever put pasta on a burger? I don't know. You said the secret ingredient was weird. And what's weirder than pasta on a burger? Well, I suppose that's true, but... So pasta was on the burger, and then Ronald McDonald face no! burst in and ate the burger! <laughs> the end! <laughs> Whoa! Hey, friends! Where have you been? You wouldn't believe us if we told you, but it was Chattanooga, Tennessee. Where's Creepy Pasta? I'd like to have a few words with that guy. Don't worry, I'm with you always. <laughs> okay, so that might have been a mistake. Not only because it's too dark, but also because Orange is inevitably gonna say the line, Hey, who turned out the lights? <laughs> oh, no, no. Okay, found my flashlight. It's all gonna be okay. Just gotta switch it on and... Flip the first switch. Yes, master. Raise the platform. Yes, master. Engage the transformer. <laughs> Yes! Yes! That's it! <laughs> I 
It's alive! It's alive! <laughs> Creepy pasta? Creepy pasta? Creepy pasta! Didn't work. Let me try. Creepy pasta, creepy pasta, creepy pasta! Nothing! This book of spells is a hunk of junk! It's midnight, you guys! It's supposed to be working right now! If I may, I have a suggestion. <laughs> That's him! That's his voice! Yes, see, you have to say my name correctly. It's creepy pasta, not creepy pasta. There's a space between the words. So, creepy pasta? Again, there's a space. You have to say it like there's a space between the two words. Creepy pasta. No. Creepy pasta? Not quite. Again, there's a space between creepy and pasta. It's like a pause. Creepy space pasta. <laughs> oh, you know what? I'm just gonna use the door like I usually do. <laughs> really? That worked? I feel like you guys knew I was coming that time. Anyway, I'm here for the third Shocktober in a row. And over the past year, I've been crafting the creepiest tales you've ever pasted. What? No questions, just listen. This creepypasta is entitled, The Slide of No Return. And in case any of you are wondering, yes, it's to die for. Yeah! <laughs> Sorry about that. Anyway, Detective Michael McTidyapple had been retired for years after failing to discover where Sandpaper Jackson was buried in 1997. He hung up his shoes for good. Or so he thought. Because when children began mysteriously disappearing on the slide at the local park, the police knew there was only one person to call. The ex-detective, who was literally the size of a child. Okay, we get it! Michael McTinyapple arrived at the park and witnessed it for himself. A young child innocently started sliding at the top of the slide disappeared into the enclosed tube section, and then never emerged. McTiny Apple assumed there must be a clog. One child got stuck, then every other child got stuck too, right? Wrong. He looked up into the slide, and there was nothing. No children, no obstructions, no apparent danger at all. After much thought with his tiny, tiny little brain, McTiny Apple decided there was only one thing to do. He would go down the slide himself. He climbed to the top of the slide, which was a large feat for an apple so, so very tiny. Dude, knock it off! And he peered down, knowing this could very well be the end of him. But someone had to figure out what was happening to all those children, and it might as well be him. A washed up tiny little man who couldn't even figure out where Sandpaper Jackson had been buried. So with one last deep breath, Michael McTiny Apple began to slide. The slide was cool and slick against his tiny little buttocks. That is, until it wasn't. Moments after he passed into the tunnel portion of the slide, the slide became rough, like sandpaper. McTiny Apple looked down and realized that it actually was sandpaper. And the further he slid across it, the more of his body was being sanded away. As he slid further, watching his body disappear before his very eyes, he finally understood what had happened to all those children. They'd been sanded away into dust. And with his final glimpse downward, moments before his eyeballs turned to dust themselves, Michael McTiny Apple made another realization. He came to understand at long last the exact location of Sandpaper Jackson's final resting place. Inside the tunnel of a slide at the local park! <laughs> So, hey, wait a second. Where is Little Apple? Oh, uh, he's probably hiding around here somewhere. Uh, you know how tiny people are, am I right? <laughs> All right, you are. Uh, you know, I wasn't so sure about this guy before, but I'm officially on board. <laughs> oh, excellent. Then perhaps you'll be on board with my next creepypasta. I call it 
does a tree make a sound? Decades ago, Vincent Perry had murdered his wife and buried her in the yard beneath an oak tree. And he'd gotten away with it, too. Not a soul suspected that he, Vincent Perry, the most boring person in town, could have done such a dastardly deed. Why did he kill his wife, you may ask? Because her voice was incredibly annoying. Seriously, every time she would open her mouth, a noise would come out like... Not quite like that, no. Closer, but no. I mean, it's, it's close, but it's not quite there. There it is! Now then, decades after his wife's tragic passing, Mr. Perry decided he wanted to build a new house. So he chopped down the oak tree in his yard. And much to his surprise, it made a remarkably familiar sound. No! No! Precisely. The noise ceased once the tree was felled, and Mr. Perry believed that he'd heard the last of that wretched noise. But alas, he had not. Because every time he did anything with that tree's wood, the noise would come again. When he built a house, the noise would come. When he built a chair, the noise would come. When he so much as picked his teeth with a splinter from the tree, the noise would come. Oh, would you just do the noise? You know very well what noise I'm talking about. Thank you. And after years of this noise, Mr. Perry was finally driven completely mad. And he was carted away to the madhouse. There he was placed in a padded room with metal furniture. There was not a speck of wood to be found anywhere, and Vincent McPerry at long last sighed sweet relief. He was finally free of the wretched noise, or so he thought. Because even though the insane asylum staff had thought of nearly everything, they had forgotten to replace the wooden floorboards. <laughs> <laughs> that was great! I think my favorite part was when the wood went ank, ank, ank. <laughs> hey, where is everyone? Oh, uh, yeah, Pear. I, I believe Pear had to step outside and uh, he had to call his mom or something. Aw, oh, man! The service in here must be total crap! And Sis had to go to uh, Pluto. I hear it's beautiful this time of year. What? Without me? She knows I've always wanted to go there. Yes, well, perhaps my final creepypasta will send you to another place. <laughs> I call this tasty tale, Finish Your Food. Prisoner Orange McJumpsuit had been on death row for years, awaiting execution for the terrible, awful, unspeakable crimes he had committed. Ooh, what did he do? I said they were unspeakable, didn't I? Now, the date of his execution had finally arrived, and the guards informed him that it was time to choose his last meal. Once he had finished his food, he would be escorted to the electric chair. The prisoner asked what was on the menu, to which he was told anything. Anything he wanted to eat, he could have. So the prisoner thought and thought, and finally answered... Spaghetti! What? No! He selected a haunted burrito! That's not how the story goes! Sure it is! You said he could have anything he wanted, right? Well, yes, but... So he chose spaghetti! A big old plate of it! And he started slurping down a really, really long noodle! I'm talking long! It took forever for him to reach the end of that thing. So long, in fact, that all the guards died of old age before he was done. The prison closed, and everyone who remembered he had committed those unspeakable crimes were long gone, too! So when the prisoner finally finished, there was nobody left to take him to the electric chair. So instead, he lived happily ever after and took kazoo lessons. Dude, enough of the kazooing! Whoa! You guys are back! Back! When did we leave? We've been here the entire time. Yeah! Ever since midnight of October 31st, 1743! Whoa! 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 <laughs> oh, wait. Calendar was just turned to the wrong page. My bad. Yeah, it's been 2021 the whole time. Oh, okay. Please. <laughs>